I'm Nick Fenter, performance coach and sports psychologist. Join me as I host some of the top athletes and industry experts in South Africa to discuss all things mental. Teach them and develop them as time goes. All things performance. You know, you've got to be able to adapt and understand what's needed at that level. And all things well-being. The body doesn't know the difference between an actual stressor and just what we're thinking about. The podcast is available at www.nickfenter.com on all podcast platforms and on YouTube. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Tom Dawson Squibb, thanks for doing this, man. I hope you are. No, no problem. Good, good to be here. Good to be here. Awesome. And how's, uh, how's lockdown been treating you? Um, yeah, it's been fine. It's obviously a lot of adaptation for someone who sort of, you know, is so used to uh, standing in rooms with people and being with people and, um, you know, doing a lot of work in the sporting world, but also in the business world. So it's been quite an adaptation. Um, but I think, um, yeah, I've managed to survive it and, um, yeah, hopefully come up with some new thinking and innovations in the time, which I'm, I'm excited about. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy. Yeah. And um, have, you, have you taken a lot of your business online or have you just kind of waited and sat back for, for this thing to pass? Um, yeah, I mean, I've had to do a lot of stuff um via zoom so I've done quite a few master classes and some consulting work with businesses via zoom i think even with our sports teams we've had to do some stuff and some of the rugby work that i'm doing we're now sort of back training so um you know that's not online um I've, i have also started a my own online course in in teaming um as to the start of the podcast so those are two sort of spawns from lockdown which have been quite got nice to do yeah um so yeah no i don't i don't think we've sort of been waiting doing nothing um but yeah so kept, kept pretty busy yeah where can people find this uh, online course that you're offering yeah i'll, I'll put it up on my, my website on my social medias and all that stuff but it's uh i'm partnered with an organization called rca consulting who do um a lot of uh, learning or they have learning platforms um so it's my own academy so if you went on rca um consulting you would then see tom dawson script academy okay cool and you uh, are you still going to be coaching uct's uh rugby side during varsity cup yeah that's definitely the plan um obviously you know we haven't been able to do too much i think our last game was on march the sixth or something and then we were preparing for the next game and then it all stopped so yeah, we haven't we haven't been able to do too much on field or anything like that, but uh, we we definitely have done a lot of planning and thinking and all that kind of stuff because you can't ever stop, you know. So yeah, yeah. but the idea is definitely to carry on. Cool. Yeah. Has there been any any kind of conversation from varsity varsity sports side on uh, when you guys may be able to start and things for next year? Yeah. Um. I think it'll definitely be delayed because the academic years have been delayed. Um, okay. We obviously don't know, you know, with the different levels and if there's going to be second waves and all those kinds of things. But I think the the idea at this stage is that in, in March um, next year, we would start so sort of a month or a little bit over a month later than we normally would start. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. It's been quite a, an interesting time and I'm, I'm quite interested to know the teams that you're involved with and things. Has there been a lot of, uh, let's say a new type of work that you've had to do um, away from the performance side of things, but rather on just the management of, of uh, the, the trauma and the, the pressures that everyone's facing and things. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, different people have been affected differently. Um, you know, in the business world, people have had to kind of carry on and find ways to survive um or keep going and just uh, you know innovate to do things differently so i suppose i i I wasn't necessarily the person they would call in around trauma or anything like that it's more you know in a performance space um in the in the rugby work with the stormers i think um we we needed to you know we we never knew it It was a strange one had we known that we were going to be on a break from march till october we may have done things differently, but we didn't know, you know, so you kept kind of going and trying to do things, keep guys stimulated, keep guys engaged. 
Yeah. Uh, I think our biggest thing was to keep guys connected because you didn't want guys just to disappear into the night and you know not to be seen for a few months. So we did do a lot of work in those early stages trying to connect guys. Um, obviously now the you know the guys have been training for quite some time and are con- reconnected together and what have you. So we I wouldn't say back to no back to normal, but we're not far from normality in terms of getting ready for matches and stuff. Yeah, for sure. And I think I heard the season might be starting now in October, the, some North-South type game and things. Do you know anything about that? Yeah, that's the plan. I mean, nothing's been in the press, which is always concerning, but yeah. certainly the plan is that, um, that there'll be a, a, like a Curry Cup or local competition uh, starting in October, early October. So that's you know, that's what we're plan, planning for at the moment, preparing for at the moment. Yeah. What is your role exactly at the Stormers? Are you an assistant coach or do you just deal with the, the performance side of things? Yeah, yeah. So leadership and performance coach. So I'm there to assist the management, assist the leadership group, assist players, um, try, you know, help make sure that the the non-rugby stuff is looked after, you know, our behaviours, our culture, our values, the things that we hold there, as well as helping coaches um be as organized and as clear in their mindsets as possible. Yeah. Um, so yeah, try and try and act as an advisor to them as much as I possibly can. Ultimately try and ask as many good questions as I can of everyone. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a lot of the, the perception about someone in your space or the performance coach or whatever is that you deal with um, just with the team and, and uh, kind of the culture and things. But a lot of the work you're actually doing is with the coaches, as you've said now. Is that something that's that's fairly new for a coach to have someone to also kind of relate to and, uh, and chat to? Yeah, Nick, you know, it's an interesting one. I think probably when I look back at how I started, you know, you start, you're enlisted, you brought in to work with players um, and help them with their mental preparation. Um, I would say how you start and then you begin to become a little bit more you may, might work with different leadership groups. So you work then a little bit more with the captain or the vice captain or certain leaders in the group. And then the, the coach sort of sees that you've got some competence and you and you know what you're talking about. And then you begin to give him feedback and advice and, and what have you. Not advice, but even just ask questions. So I think over the years that I've been doing this now, which 12 years or so, um, my role's probably evolved quite a lot. So I would say at the Stormers, I would spend quite a substantial more time with management than I would be with players. Okay. Whereas in the early days, it might have been the other way around. Um, yeah, now my role is, is, is very much to be someone who, who can play a role around looking at how we're we doing things um, in the management group. Yeah. In fact, I'm quite insistent on that. I'm not, I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm not interested, but I'm, I'm not as, um, keen on a role that doesn't involve that because I just believe that to just work with the players there's too much influence that comes from the coaching staff um, that you can do this one, as, as much work as you want with the playing group but the coaching staff is still very influential so that you need to be working at that level too yeah yeah and um, where does this love uh, for leadership come from for you I mean you've, you've been doing this when I, when I played Marty's cricket, you came in, and that could have been eight years ago. So you've obviously been dealing with this type of thing for a long time. Where does this love come from? Yeah, I mean, I, probably 12, you know, 12 years doing this. But I, I think even when I was at school, I was like coaching sport, you know, and then I coached some cricket and I coached some rugby. Um, and then I probably realized that I studied some something, and then I realized that she's actually quite like... I like the team elements of, of, of sports. I like the people elements of sports. I like to see um, how people can collaborate well together. Um, I think ultimately I'm, I'm, I'm a pretty competitive guy. So I, I, I enjoy the idea of winning. I enjoy the idea of collectives being able to create something special. Um, and that was an area that was sort of open for, or opened up for me that I could marry my skill set with my passion. And, and, and that's kind of what happened, you know? So, and then it's evolved over the years, you know, your role evolves depending on who you work with. Um, you'll play different roles. Um, 
it might have the same title. You might be called a, whatever you call the leadership and performance coach or a mental coach or a performance coach or whatever they call you. But your role is always slightly different based on how you and the head coach work in, in, in collaboration. You know? Yeah. yeah. And obviously when you move from, from like rugby to cricket, which you've done quite often, and uh, from province to province, I know you were at the Sharks at a stage, um, I think you even worked in, in football at a stage. And then you go over to, to India and to Australia, where I know you've done some gigs. How much does the culture and things change when you're overseas in different kind of uh, countries and teams rather than locally? I mean, I suppose where, where, where I've been a little bit of a cheat is even working in India and Australia, there were South African coaches. Okay. Um, so, you know, I think I... There were, it was a slight easier connection. That's not to say that there weren't some Indian coaches and some Australian coaches. I'm just saying the head coach in both those environments were, were South African. Uh, yeah, there are always cultural differences. Um, Nick, I think you've got to you've got to be a, a, a alert to that and alive to that. You know, I can come into a space in India and say like, oh, you know, I've worked with the Stormers or I've done this. Like, they're going to laugh you off out the room. You know, you need to be curious and you need to be willing to listen. Yeah. Um, to people and be observant. I think um, the more time you spend there, the more you can pick things up. Uh, what motivates different people? Uh, what are the little sort of cultural norms? You know, in Australia, when when they start teasing you, it's a good thing. You know, it yeah. means they uh, it means they like you. Um, in India, it's you know it's probably a little bit different. There's a real sort of hierarchical way about things. Um, if you're not going to get through the head honcho players, you, you you're kind of wasting your time. Um, uh, in terms of trying to impact impact a team, um, but you know, there are, there's a lot of respect, or certainly overt respect there. So there's yeah, there's different cultures. But even in South Africa, you know, like if you work with a predominantly English team versus working with a predominantly Afrikaans team or a Kosa Zulu team, um, there's, there's there's different cultural cultural nuances to that, which which I've seen through my career. You know, I think back to working with the South African ladies rugby team, that was probably predominantly Kosa and Zulu. Um, like that would be the main, obviously, in rugby in South Africa. A lot, a lot of Afrikaans, um, and then obviously some teams sort of more English types. And there's different nuances to that, and and, and things you need to get right. You know, if you want to work yeah. in those spaces. At what stage? going through this process of starting off, you know, as a young guy, um, then you work at some varsity cup sides, Marty's and, and UCT, and then you're working in the IPR with some of the cricket's biggest superstars. At what stage do you start feeling that you can actually make a difference at the level of, you know, MS Stoney and whoever you had in that side um, compared to working with kind of teenagers or young students? I don't know what's easier. Um, I'm not sure if one is easier and one's harder. They just they are different. Um, I think you know if you go into a if you go into a space. Yeah, I didn't spend a lot of time in India, you know. But like if if you go into that Indian space and you've got the endorsement of the head coach who has already got credibility, it's easier, you know. Um, and then you go in there and you don't go in guns blazing saying this is how things are going to work, but you just try and start to ask questions and help them get clarity within their own thinking. I would say that's kind of the way um, the, the way you do it. Now, if I go into a Marty's or a, or, a, or a University of Cape Town or a school or whatever, it might be a little bit easier because you know, less ego maybe, uh, but also, you know, you've worked at a higher level than they have, so it might win you a little bit of credibility. But I still think it doesn't matter who you are. You've still got to win. You're still got to connect with human beings, um, and you've still got to you've still got to get them to buy in and into you. You know. Um, so I think you've got to be very careful. I've got to be very careful if I went into a student team now, just because I've worked with some elite athletes, that I've still got to work as hard to build connections with them as I would do with the elite athletes and not to go in there like, oh, you know, I know everything. And this is because I think then you're, then you're not very useful. Yeah. yeah. So you can't, you can't, because you've, you've met some famous sportsmen or whatever, you can't get that ego and be like, well, I'm also a famous person. So you guys are lucky to have me. As soon as that comes into your, 
your mindset, then you obviously start losing the quality of your work. Yeah, I, I, I mean, the reality is like, you know, I'm, I'm not a famous person and I, I um, yeah, it's, it, it's not about that. I think maybe if I walk into a room and, 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 and people introduce you and they say, you know, yeah, he's worked in India and he's worked in Australia and he's done this, they'll say, okay, well, look, let's give this guy a chance. But I think you you've got it buys you five minutes, you know, <laughs> yeah. um, and and then you've got to be able to connect with people, um, show as much interest in people, um, and still demonstrate skill. Uh, and I think that's the big thing for me is like I must make sure like if I'm going to work with a group or with a person that I'm like I'm there, I'm present, I'm interested, I want to help them. And um, so for me, like I yeah, you know, it's, it's 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 sometimes less about who you're working with, but it's more around what the connections like. Like I can have some really amazing sessions if I feel like the connection's great with people that are not famous, whatever. And then sometimes you can work with an elite team, uh, and it's actually it's it's not great. You know, it's yeah. dreary, it's difficult. Um, yeah. So yeah. So as a performance coach, do you actually prefer working with? with groups and teams rather than just individuals or do you do both uh, fairly equally? Yeah, it's a good question. Like I, I, I definitely don't not like working with individuals. Um, I think maybe my strength is with teams. Um, and, and, and it's, you know, but, but, but that's not to say that I, I, I put it this way. Like I wouldn't want to fill my day up with individual work, Okay. but I wouldn't mind filling my day up with team. Work. Okay. That doesn't mean that I don't like working with some key individuals and having really in-depth conversations and trying to help them. I do. I just, I don't get, I, would, I wouldn't like to have too much of it because I, I find it, it's, it's, it's obviously quite, well, draining is not the right word, but it, it requires a, a lot of a certain type of energy. Um, and I do enjoy the collective. I do enjoy feeding off different people and stuff. So, yeah, yeah. yeah I'd say I'm probably more, on the team space than the individual space. Yeah. And when you get into a, a team environment, you've been asked to, to join the ship now and things, how much work you would you say goes into individual work in the start in order to get to know the people better? Or is it just teamwork kind of from the, from the get go? Just repeat. Sorry, Nick, I'm not quite following. So, so let's say, I don't want to speak about the stormers cause you've kind of touched on that, but let's say a team would, would ask you to join now, um, perhaps when the when you went over to the rebels, now you've got to get to know the team, and obviously it's hard to do that if you're always dealing with them in a group. So how much of your work is done with individuals in that space, and how much with the team? Yeah, I mean you learn quite quickly that you've got to connect with the right people, you know. Um, so spend time quickly with a captain, you know. Like, can we go for a coffee? Can we have a chat? Um, you know, you might you might sit there, you know, in Melbourne and the, the team's having a meeting and then on the way out, you just pull someone, oh, what was that meeting like for you? You walk onto the onto the training park and you make sure you walk with a couple of guys. Hey, how's it going? And you connect with people, you know, informally as much as you possibly can. Um, I think the more you're able to do that, the more likely you are to be useful in the role, you know. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I would say very, very important to connect with individuals, despite yeah. just working. You know, yeah, very important. Yeah. So I mean, if you if you're working with when you're connecting with the individuals, it seems like it's very much on the informal basis. But if you're connecting with, um, or if you're part of a team, sorry, how much of that is actually informal work that you just kind of in the environment you're available to speak to, and how much is like sit down formal sessions? Yeah, I mean, I think in Melbourne. Um, I did do a fair bit of one-on-one -on -one work. Now, some people would be like, "Hey, every week we're going to sit down and we're going to we're going to have a half an hour chat." Some would be, you know, walking to the training field and you do, you know, it's um, uh, what's his name, uh, McCartney. He was the one of the assistant coaches at um, the Melbourne Demons, and he spoke about uh, walking coaching. And he says, you can do a lot of your best coaching when you're just strolling with someone, you know. And I think that was true for me. You just having you in a kissy the guy in the kitchen and you have a chat so i would say a lot of a lot of it happens like that you know even these days sometimes you just start having conversations with guys over whatsapp um uh, and then some guys will sit down and then you know you might just do that and then you say okay you know what why don't we sit down why don't we book half an hour together to have a proper chat about this yeah uh, now sometimes you'll initiate that um sometimes the player will initiate that i i would say for me 
it's probably more that that, that, that me as a coach would have to initiate that you know yeah, yeah do you prefer working as a as a performance coach uh kind of coming in supporting the management or do you prefer being the head coach like at uh, uct yeah once again like i'm not it's, it's it's hard to say what i prefer i think you know i have head coached before um and on the 20 level at schoolboy level um, and I, I derive a huge amount of joy from it. You know, I, I love it. I, I, I sort of buy in a lot to it. Um, I want to succeed. Um, so I think there's a there's a real part of me that that gets a huge amount of um, joy from it. Um, and then there's another part of me that really enjoys diversity of work and being able to do different things. Um, and the, the the way that I've sort of structured my career as a performance coach and consultant allows me then to get that diversity you know so you can go and work with different entities and different people so yeah it's hard to say which one do i prefer um i just i like both to be honest um you just gotta you wear the different hats you know so i've got to wear a different hat as a head coach than i would wear as a performance coach yeah yeah being involved at, at schools you quickly realize that um mentorship plays an important role in a young kid's life to have some teachers or some coaches that are are more than just a coach or a teacher they play a mentorship role in things does that change when you get to senior professional sides or does mentorship play as an important role up there yeah i think everyone needs a bit of mentoring don't they nick like um you got different just because you're older doesn't mean you don't have issues in fact sometimes when you're older, you've got bigger issues, you know, yeah. like, like there's no, there's less to worry about when you're a kid than there is, um, than when you're older. I mean, I mean that flippantly, but you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I, I, uh, I think everyone needs a bit of mentoring. They might not come to you. They might have other mentors. In fact, I think sometimes think it's good for guys to have mentors outside the game. Okay. Um, no, it might be this, they, 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 they passed at their church or it might be their dad or it might be, someone that they've met you know i think different people have different mentors and i think it's sometimes good to be outside the game yeah um yeah i think that it can be healthy you know otherwise your life can be consumed by your sport yeah yeah and you play do you feel you play you like a mentorship role when you get involved in teams um for long periods of times or is your role strictly what it is um i don't know uh nick like Maybe to some, but I, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I don't see myself as a mentor, to be honest. Um, I see myself as an advisor, um, an advisor and coach, and someone who can help ask the right questions. Someone's got an, something they want to bounce off or get off their chest. I can I can be there. I, I don't see myself necessarily as a mentor. Someone has long, deep mentoring relationships with, with, with people. Yeah. In, in in some of these environments that I work. Yeah. In. So, who are some of the mentors for you growing up? Sure. It's <laughs> a good question. Um, yeah, I mean, I think one or two people at school days were pretty influential for me. I think um, after school, I've been lucky, you know, a chap that I've done a lot of work with, um, Rowan Balchers, has been a great mentor to me um, in terms of helping me shape my career, ask the right questions, um, and really help me. Um, I'd say he's probably been one of my, probably my strongest mentor. Um, over the sort of last 10, 11 years, you know? Um, and, and I think in this world you need it eh? because sure, you don't always have the answers. I still don't have the answers. And you go into the environments where you don't know what you're doing yeah. uh, and you've got to work it out. And um, to have that mentor and that advice is just absolutely vital. Eh? Yeah, yeah. And um, if you go into a, environment with the head coach like Gary Kirsten do you feel you learn a lot from him and perhaps also take on a, a mentee mentorship role or is that more friendship well I'll answer the first part of the question do I learn a lot from him absolutely you know um I you know the guy the guy is a unbelievable cricket coach unbelievable leader massively significant human being um with whom I think we share a deep passion of 
performance and coaching and getting people to do well you know like we've got different outlooks we've got different ways but we definitely share that passion so do i learn a lot from him yeah i'd like to think he learned some stuff from me as well um i know that he you know he believes that i possess a skill set and a way of thinking that complements his um and that he thinks is useful to have around and i mean certainly when we have conversations together whether it's just the two of us or with people watching, um, they're generally pretty rich and pretty they're, they're, they're cool to be part of, you know. So I don't know. I, 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 I don't know if Gary's a mentor, and I'm certainly not a mentor to him, but um, I, I definitely learn from him. Definitely yeah. learn from him. Yeah. I think if you asked him, is he a mentor to me, he'd say no. Okay. So I don't want to yeah. say that he is, you know what I mean? But yeah. Um, yeah. We definitely have a good, a really cool relationship that I that I, I value a lot. You know? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I'm trying to understand one thing, and this is part of the reason I want to, I really wanted to chat to you is a trend that started to happen, especially during lockdown, but even before, was people try and get you in, kind of do one talk with a team. You know, you're doing a, a online Zoom webinar with with this team or that team, and they kind of go and say we we're using this mental coach or sports psychologist but as far as i'm concerned no real change is going to happen with, with one hour long kind of presentation that you're doing uh, in a boardroom so part of what i believe in is that in order to make a real change for someone in your position is you actually got to become part of the team become part of the culture and spend a lot of time um in that kind of environment compared to just doing one off session here and one off session there. Uh, also before I go on, is that something you would agree with or do you think change can happen in that one kind of webinar session? Well, well let me ask, let me, let me throw it back at you. What's your experience has been? Well, I, I get frustrated every time because the time's up before I can actually get to know anyone that I'm talking to. So as soon as the question and answer session might start, then you feel, um, now you're engaging. Now you're getting to see how these people are thinking. They're not just sitting listening to you. You get a chance to listen to them. And at the end of the day, it's about them. You know? So I, got, I get frustrated. I, I don't like doing one-off sessions at all. Um, but it is what it is because there's obviously budgetary restraints with people and not a lot of teams can afford someone full-time and so on. So you kind of try and do what you can. But, yeah, that's, that's how I would have say. You, have you done a, a, a one-off session where you feel like there's been value? Yeah, I think I think individuals take value. Um, I think there'll be one individual or two individuals at every session that that that's taken something from whatever you've said. But I don't think I've ever felt that I've made a real change in the team culture and the team performance with one session. You know, mm. how you, do you measure your success? Um, I want feedback. Um, so. So if I see that whatever I've spoken to with the, with the coach, when I keep in contact with that coach, I try and see this feedback going into the next few sessions at practice. Has there been a difference? Um, has the key individuals changed the way they approach things? Uh, is that hierarchy thing that might be a problem? If it is, um, is it kind of disappeared a little bit? Are the guys closer? So I try and keep in contact with all the coaches and then uh, I'll measure it based on their feedback. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, those are some cool responses. You know, like I, I mean, I'm asking you because I, I, I don't know if I've got the answer. Um, you know, I think the idea of being part of a team, wearing the kit, um, is cool, uh, but it comes with its own challenges. Um, it's not always necessarily that time efficient. So, you know, you might be spending a lot of time with a cricket team and let's say you're not a cricket coach, you're just kind of watching a lot of nets, you know, and you can try and chat, with, but it's not that time efficient. And um, I think also what you want to try and do is, is, is you want to influence across lands, but you also need to stay in your land. Hmm. So you might be someone who understands cricket or you might be someone who understands rugby or soccer, or whatever sport people that are listening to this are involved in. And I think like for me working in rugby, at the storm is like, I understand rugby, I coach rugby, I get it, but I'm not there to worry about rugby. Um, so I need to make sure that I stay in my lane. Now, of course, I can unpick, I can follow what's going on, and I might be able to ask a question or two, but I'm pretty, I'm, I try my hardest to make sure that when it comes to things of rugby, it's, that's for the coaches to do, that's not for me to do. 
Um, so I think that's important. And I'm not fully answering your question, but I, th I think that's important. And it's not always easy to get right when you're like fully immersed in a place because then you like want to get involved in lots of different stuff. Yeah. Um, I just think often you will work with a team. Um, even if you work with a team or an individual, you're never with them all the time. So if you do a one-on-one -on -one with a player, you're with them for one hour of 168 hours in that week. Like it's a, it's a fraction of the time, mm. you know? Um, so you've got to be generous with yourself as to like, what is success? You know, like how, how are you managing success? So I reckon in a one-off session, you might be able to have an impact. Would yeah. you have more impact if you had a longer relationship? Yes, of course. Um, but I wouldn't think that you can't have an impact. So what I would always try and do, like if I were you is, okay, guys, I don't want to do one session, but let's contract for three. Mm. And then you build a little arc for yourself. You know, you're like, okay, first one, I'm going to work really hard on getting to know them. Second one, I'm going to get really hard on challenging them a little. Third one, I'm going to work really hard on developing new habits with them. Yeah. You know, um, so if you can, like push one session to three, but don't feel that it's either one session or fully immersed in a team because I think that's too binary. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think you'll probably find you can go in and do really cool interventions or like a series of interventions by contracting with a team. Let's say you were the schoolboy team for six months. Okay, coaches, over six months, let's do five or six sessions together, you know? Yeah. Two sessions in the preseason in the camp. One session... Um, three weeks into season to check the habits one session before the big game at the end of term one. Okay. We're going to come back. We're going to do a reevaluation session um, at the start of term three. I'm just thinking of a rugby or hockey team. Course, here. Yeah. And then we're going to do one more uh, just towards the back end of the season, three games to go um, just to sort of wind off and make sure that we finish with a bang. Yeah. Uh, in between that, I want to make sure that I have two, um, touch bases with you and the captain together and that you and I every second week uh, connect with each other. It's going to cost you X amount of money. And I believe that that can add a lot of value. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, that's what I'd be looking at contracts. That's how I'd be looking at contracts with them. Yeah. I think why, why I get frustrated as well is because as you said earlier, your, your skill set perhaps lies more with, with teams and organizations. Whereas from my background and, and my kind of, academic background and studies and experience are more suited I feel to individual work so a bit of clinical psychology background and obviously that process you see them once a once a week maybe but you see them for six months and that's how you kind of generate the change so maybe I'm trying to fit that into a team environment and the approach is just different yeah I mean I think if you're I think that the fact that you've got knowledge around where your strength lies is important because you know, you'll often get brought in to go work with a team. But you're saying, well, actually, my strength isn't working with a team. So maybe what it's about doing is it's about saying, I want to do, I want to spend, um, break the team, let's say it's a cricket team, you've got 15, 14 people. Yeah. I want to spend 45 minutes with a group of seven and another group of seven and just sit down on your chair and have a conversation with them because that's your strength. You're not there to stand in front of the room and show their models and stuff if that's not your strength. So sit down, have a conversation with them, explain what it is, and then and then contract. Say, right, guys, um, I'm willing to do tranches of three or six sessions with individuals that's going to cost X amount. And you go to the school or the club or the union and you say, would you be willing to subsidize some of this or, or whatever? And then, and then you might find a couple of guys come to you and they say, you know, um, we'd like to do some one-on-one -on -one work with you. Great. You know, and if that's yeah. your strength, I think you should you should push that. You should stick to that. Yeah, yeah. Have you find it tough just, you know, growing up in this environment or growing up in this profession? Sorry, there's just some noise in the background. Um, did you find it tough to kind of build a, a bit of credibility and a and a good name and things like that? Yeah, I think it's I think it's perpetually tough. Eh? Um, might look cool like you're working with sports people and it's all cool but it's like it's always tough you know like hmm. um you don't know if you're doing good work and you don't know if you're going to get work and you know all that stuff i think um yeah it's a really really slow build nick and hmm. it's about getting opportunities to work with people and then hopefully do really good work with them and then you know you build up your cv and your credibility um over time but 
but it is a slow build. I, I believe yeah. it is a slow build, and that's and that's fine, you know. But if you focus on where you are and you do as best possible work as you can, I think your work will begin to speak for itself. Yeah. And you have to be slightly entrepreneurial and seek work. I don't think you can just sit as a youngster and just hope it's going to come to you. For sure, Some people yeah. will tell you they can, and and and. And maybe they can, maybe you can, but that's just not necessarily my belief. My, my yeah. belief is you've got to go and look for it a little bit. Yeah. Was there ever a period in your life where you thought, geez, am I actually doing the right thing here? Um, maybe yeah. I should just look into something else. Yeah, probably often. Yeah. <laughs> probably often. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, for me, Nick, it, it, like I started doing some work in the space and then I actually decided and then I, I went, I uh, left completely. I went into, I got into marketing and I was so crap at it. So I didn't know what I was doing. Yeah. And um, then I decided to start my own business and go and do a master's at the, sort of the same time or the following year. And um, so when I started my own business, like to be honest, the only team or anyone I'd worked with, I worked with like a couple of individuals and a couple of school teams. That was pretty much all I had. And then I like just went and knocked on a few doors and said, can I work with you? And I probably got a bit lucky is yeah. that a few people said yes. Um, and then those people that said yes did quite well. And, and then suddenly you've got a bit of a story to tell. you like, you know, I was part of some successful campaigns and people, people will back you and say, oh, you know, Tom, you were, Tom was good at this or Tom was good at that or Nick was good at this and Nick was good at that. Um, and then you, you know, you work a bit and then you have like some troughs and you're like, oh, I'm not getting that much work anymore. You know, now what? Um, I, yeah, I, I've probably been quite lucky in that I, I, I've generally had a, a steady stream of work to do. But I've also done a fair bit of corporate stuff and still do some corporate stuff, which allow, you know, which pays a lot of the bills. Yeah. Because the sports stuff doesn't pay the bills, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so I've been quite lucky there um, in doing that work as well. Yeah. Do you enjoy the corporate stuff? Is it something you'll keep doing forever or is it really just mm. to pay the bills? No, no, no. I do enjoy it. I do enjoy it. I think it's around also finding a niche. I'm really enjoying working with teams at the moment. Mm. Um, and I, I do enjoy it. I don't enjoy all of it, but I don't enjoy all the sports stuff either, you know. Mm. But... Um, no, I do enjoy working with some teams who are bought in and they're keen and they invest. They're willing to invest in their in their potential. You know, I, I love the idea. Nick, for me, the idea of like creating a sort of remarkable story, something you're sitting down when you're seven years of age with your brand and coke, and you on the stoop and you're talking about that success you had as a collective. Like I, 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 that that really drives me. You know, I enjoy that. So I want to be part of helping people do that. So the the, the whilst I love the theatre of sports, um. I believe I can I can use that skill set in the in the business world as well. And and what I really like about it is the challenge. Um, yeah. Sport is not easy, but for different reasons. And I think sometimes when you work with some like super super smart people in in business, it challenges you in different ways. And I think that's important for me. In fact, to be skilled at what I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it not hard though when you when you're in a sports team and everyone's kind of have has a collective goal and it's to win the Curry Cup or to win the IPL or whatever, and then in business, at least 50% of the people you may deal with aren't really there for a goal other than just to kind of pay the bills, make some money, and, and go home. Yeah, I, it's an interesting it's an interesting thing you ask there because you'll be surprised. Like, I'm just thinking of a couple of teams that I'm working with at the moment or people that I'm working with at the moment. Like, I don't pick that up at all here. Eh? I really people yeah like I know the stats will tell you that but sure the large large majority of people that I'm currently interfacing with geez they want to be better huh? they yeah. want to succeed they want to get promoted they want their team to do well um, what are they willing to do to get that maybe different maybe you know the Olympic athletes or the professional sportsman might be willing to do flipping choppers in her, her ear off to, to get the trophy, maybe not for someone working in an IT business. But yeah, people want to do well there. Eh? People yeah. want to do well. Yeah. So, I mean, if you have to compare the two, is there a general kind of consensus for a team to be successful? There are certain things that are non-negotiables that need to be in place. 
Um, and can you relate those between sports and business and share some of those? In- yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's obvious ones, you know, like I've got my models and things that I work with, but there's some obvious things like why, why do we even exist? Why are we here? Why are we put together as a team? Like that's really important. Now, it's, in sports, sometimes it's easy. Mm. You know, we're trying to win a competition because we're professional sportsmen and people who are watching are paying to watch because they want to be inspired. Great. Now, sometimes in business, it's different. So we firstly got to realize, like, why are we here? What's the challenge we're here to overcome? Uh, we've then got to make sure we know, like, okay, so what are the processes and behaviors we need in place to enable us to overcome that challenge? And let's mm-hmm. agree on those. And let's agree on how we're going to track them. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, let's look at, okay, cool. Often you can have these great workshops with teams or with people, and they go away and they're like, well, what am I meant to do now? You mm-hmm. know, so sometimes spending time with, well, often spending time with teams saying, all right, I call it the first domino. So I, if you think of a line of dominoes, you push the first one over and they all fall over. Like you've got to help teams find what's their domino, what's their one thing. Is it a meeting once a week? Is it a way of feeding back? Is it a way of reporting? What 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 is it? Um, so I think helping teams identify that. And then, um, you know, there's the dynamic, there's the dynamic stuff. So, and when I say dynamic, not does Nick like Tom and does Tom like Nick? Um, there's more to it than that. You know, you, you look at how teams have discussions when you're with them. And you say, geez, this is interesting. Like, we're trying to solve a pretty complex problem here. And what I'm noticing is three of you are withdrawing and the others are dominating the conversation. What's happening there? You know, is that an indication of how you usually work out in the world as well, in the real world? Yeah. So you'll pick up a lot in your workshops that give you clues as to how people actually interact outside. So your skill as a, as a team coach or facilitator, whatever it is, is actually to like almost be sensing all the time. You're wanting to be watching, not just listening to what's being said, but watching what's been done as well. Yeah, yeah, for sure. There's a there's there's a lot of cliche in this world where people speak of having a team culture, and and then you kind of go into the team and they say, yeah, well, there should be trust and there should be um, good communication and all these things. But there's a difference between saying these things and actually. Not fixing them, but putting them in place so that they're long-lasting and actually make it make a change. Yeah, a hundred percent. You know, like um, I think it's easy to educate people about teaming. You can go and you can Google it, but I can go and tell people, you know, like COVID culture, trust. I mean, there's a million flipping podcasts and Google articles, and everyone will tell you about trust. And like we know that. Yeah. Um, actually, coaching people to be able to implement that themselves and get, uh, obtain the outcomes of trust um, and 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 a good culture that's that's harder you know because there's so many different but so many different ingredients different personalities different beliefs um, different contexts different systems um, that you need to be mindful of that you know um, so yeah I think the cliche stuff it's it's all right it's not that it's not right yeah. but to go and work with a team and just tell them they need a good culture like it's not, it's not massively valuable. I yeah. think most people know that. Yeah, yeah. How do you navigate, you know, in South African sports specifically in, in today's world, how do you navigate the unique differences between the cultures and you have individuals coming from not just, you know, racial differences, but financial differences and, and generally cultural and historical differences. How do you navigate that in order to find a, a good middle ground? Yeah, you know, um, Nick, I think the key word, and it's been such a strong word for me in the last probably six months, is curiosity. Mm. I think the teams that really succeed are curious about each other and curious about how to get better. Yeah. Um, people who advocate their own position all the time, I'm not sure those those teams succeed, you know. Um, so in any team that, I, that, that I'm working with, I would love to see that curiosity. So I would love people to be interested in, different people's cultures and where they come from. And, you know, storytelling is such a powerful way of doing that. Um, yeah. Well, that would certainly be my thing. So I know, you know, some coaches spend a lot of time talking to their players, but, you know, finding out stuff about their players, um, even just as human beings, forget them being an actual sportsman, just find out about them being human beings. Yeah. And then once you've connected with people, it becomes easier to coach them. I, I believe anyway. Yeah. Um, you know what? What Gary Gary Kirsten always said, said to me. In fact, it was Gary and Eric Simon said to me. Um, you know, connection before content. Seek seek to understand before seeking to be understood. 
Um, and it's such a vital thing for us as aspirant coaches and people in the world to, to do, you know. Yeah, yeah. But, you, I mean, you may find guys in, in a team environment that aren't curious, you know. Can you coach that or is it a mind change that you're going to have to make over time? I think, I think um, look, changing people is hard, but I think what you can do is you can make it something that gets done in the environment. So the environment is often, often trumps the, like, the personality, you know. So people will behave differently in one environment than they will in another because the environment has got pulling forces itself. So yeah. what the leadership emphasizes, you know. So if, the, if, you're a, if you're a leader of a system or a coach of a team and you're big on like relationships and people greeting each other and all that, you'll probably find people will start to gravitate towards that. Yeah. What you've got to realize is that also because they're gravitating towards that, they might be gravitating away from something else. So yeah. every 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 orientation or, or, or culture has got a has got a bright side and it's got a dark side. And you need to be mindful of that that you are aware of those blind spots. So if you are a heavy relationship team, that you're not just all about vibe but not about performance and standards and accountability. Yeah. Um so it's a, yeah, it's a fine it's a fine balance to get right. Um yeah. I forgot your question. I was carrying on there. Sorry. No, no, you actually answered it pretty, pretty perfectly. It's okay. It's, it's hard to ch- can you change that person who's who's not willing to be curious and 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 you know listen and accept different cultures? Can you actually change them? Yeah, I agree with you. If if the environment's right and uh, the coach is leading that conversation, the players that are resistant will will follow eventually. Yeah, yeah. I think I think that's the that's kind of the, the, the process. And yeah, you might have to do an interven- intervention with a specific individual. Absolutely. Um, but it's fascinating how an environment can begin to sway people. You know, yeah. work with a, get get a critical mass doing something. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 and this might be controversial, and I'm not saying you should ever allow for behaviors that aren't in the team realm and that don't help the team. But you know, sometimes. I've been into sides and people were like players and co- or whatever, and they'll be like moaning about one or two people. Now, of course, you don't want energy sappers in your team and cancers in the team and all of that stuff. But I'm like, there could be 25 people in your squad who are doing amazing things, and now you're worrying about the two that aren't. Yeah. Why don't you focus on the 25 that are doing amazing things, boost them, so that those two either catch up or they piss off. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, and I think that's an approach most coaches don't take. I think you're always trying to change the one or two that might not fit in with your kind of idea of how it should be. And by putting all the focus on them, you're obviously turning the focus into the negative energy and not to the positive energy. Exactly, exactly. Um, Yeah, I don't know if I can say more about that. I think you're spot on. Hmm. What's your experience been? What's your experience been of... of, um, working with people who are sort of contrary to the environment and how, how have you how have you managed to work with them? Yeah, I think I think it depends on what level you're coming into the system. So um, I mean I've I, I've yet to find players that are not willing to learn, especially the younger players, you know, they they're very open to accepting, I think maybe because they've grown up with no historical kind of context to go on they've grown up in a in let's call it a free society or whatever they've been in the class with these guys and from grade one and uh, they're more willing to be open and accepting uh, where i found resistance is often at, at management level you know where management's still resistant to pick a certain player or to spend more time with a certain player so there it really depends on on the role i've never come into a space in the same role that you have with the Stormers where you're actually working with management. I've been kind of left alone with the teams and the players and said, you know, come report back to us, but we're not going to be involved with you in that system, which has very rarely worked well. Um, but as I said, I, I like to deal with things on an individual level. Yeah. Oh, and you know, it might be worth you challenging the, the staff and just saying, you know, like I'm keen to work with, with your team, but I think, the main impactor, the main influencer in this team is still you, the head coach. Mm. It's not me. Never will be me. So for you to not be part of, and then they'll often use the they'll often use the excuse, um, I want guys to be free to speak without me. Yeah, you know, and maybe sometimes that's the case. But I can tell you now, very rare that I've ever wanted to do sessions without the coach there. Mm. Every now and then, if there is, but 
even like what's that saying about the culture that the guys can't speak in front of their coach? Yeah. Yeah. You know, like that I don't I don't I don't get that, you know. Um so I would rather say, well hang on, why don't we come in the room together and let's talk about the system? Because mm. you know, do a little survey of the players. What are the three behaviors you love to see from your coach that inspire you? Yeah. Coach, coaches, what are the three behaviors you love to see from players that inspire you? Okay, cool, let's put those up on the board. Okay. Mm. What gets in the way of those behaviors being shown? No, when I'm not selected or what, what you know, if I'm tired from school or whatever. Okay, cool, let's bring those into light. Okay, cool. So when one of those things happens, I've had a tough day with my Afrikaans homework or whatever it might be, what can we do as a team to help each other? Mm. Um, I know you said you, you, you like to help the individual. Absolutely. But I also know that you want the you want the people you're working with to do well, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. And 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 I, so I would I would I would challenge or I would challenge the staff a little bit to be more involved. Mm. I think it's unless a, you are just purely doing one-on-one work and you just want to do deeper and one work. Like, I understand that can be different. Yeah, the problem comes in when you are coming in and saying, "Well, I'm doing more one-on-one work," and three, four, five of the individuals are saying, "Look, this is some of my problems." Is this and this and this with the coach or the or the manager, and they ask you not to go and speak out about that out of fear of being victimized or dropped. So you the individual thing also creates its own problems where you actually can't help that individual thrive better within his his environment if you're not also helping the environment. You know, so it, it goes both ways, and I think to develop those skills, obviously for someone like you or me, is important. Agreed. Absolutely agree. Absolutely agree. Yeah. What are some of the uh, some of the books that you might recommend to people to read on team culture, or any books that you've recently found very interesting? Uh, yeah, the Culture Code is a great book by a chap called Dan Coyle. Uh, I'd say one of the better books I've read on culture. Um, if you want some like stories and stuff around someone who's worked in the space, Paddy Upton's book is definitely worth reading. Yeah. Um, I trying to think what I've read sort of more recently. Um, yeah, I mean, I enjoy reading books like from head coaches. You know, I enjoyed Eddie Jones's book. I enjoyed a guy called Paul Paul Ruse, not Paul Ruiz, Paul Ruse, but spelt the same as Paul Ruiz. He he coached um, in the AFL in Australia for many years, and I I, I really enjoyed his book. I found it interesting some of the work they did around leadership and leadership development. Um, within the sports teams was it was really interesting. Um, you know, there's a few books I I really enjoyed a book called The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg. Um, I found that really really uh, a useful book to think about and read. Um, I don't know the list could go on and on. I've read like a yeah. lot over the years. You know? um, yeah. But if you are involved in the team space, I you know, started Culture Code. I think it's a great book. Yeah. Yeah. So you, uh, you've spoken of habits a few times today. Um, and obviously that's something you try and implement is healthy habits, healthy um, expectations and all of that. But to turn the tables back to you, what type of habits do you try and implement in your own personal life in order to ensure that you stay on the ball? To ensure that I stay? Stay on the ball. Just, you know, don't, don't drop, uh, don't get lazy. Don't, uh, don't start slacking and whatever. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I mean, like laziness is not a massive problem for me. Um, uh, but you, that doesn't mean you can't slack. Um, so you can sometimes, you've got to be careful if you get very busy, then you sort of like, oh, I'll just run that session here, or I'll do that there. And you're not, that's not being lazy. It's just a, like, you don't have the time. So mm. I think what I'm really trying to work on is, is to be intentional around what, like, kind of what I say yes to and what I'm going to focus my time on. Um, I would say the simplest uh, habit I do is, is prepare. Mm. Um, I, I won't do a session unless I'm prepared. I must have written stuff down, typed it, or written on a piece of paper, and know what I'm going to do. Um, you often don't stick to what you prepared, but that's the nature of working with teams. Um, but must prepare. Uh, I would say it's my biggest habit. I walk around with a little book. A little book the size that sits in my pocket. People that work with me will probably know it and say, oh, there's Tom and his little book. Um, yeah. I know there's technology and stuff, but I like having a little book. And me and my book being around all the time, writing notes down, thinking. I sometimes think like I might be the traffic lights and come up with a good idea. Um, 
you know, in, wherever, in the gym, I, I must be able to document stuff down. So I'd say the best thing is writing stuff down. Um, is probably my biggest thing to make sure that uh, writing stuff down and preparing for yeah. everything. Because yeah. I think that you can go and do stuff without preparing, but oh, it's risky. Yeah. It's, very, it's very risky. And it's your reputation is what you kind of sell on. So if you if you lose out on one session, you, you can damage your reputation pretty quickly. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And do you follow any daily routines when you wake up at 5 a.m. or 6 a.m. strictly exercise or do you flow? No, I would love to give you some Robin Sharma story about waking <laughs> up at 5 a.m. I, I don't, I don't, yeah. I'm not a big fan of that. Um, okay. I'm not a big fan of that. I go through phases. Sometimes I'm like, I want to be massively productive in the morning. At the moment, I'll, I'll be honest with you, like I found the lockdown period, um, um, it's been quite intense. I found it really intense. Um, you know, like it's just my nature. Like I want to do, do, do and get busy going and be, be sort of productive and stuff. And um, so I kind of try and, and not like fly into things in the morning, like take my time a little bit. Because um, I find sometimes when I get like that, it doesn't help. But then I'll go through phases. So, so you know, let's say if we're in the like throes of a campaign or I'm coaching at varsity or something like that, then I might want to get up early and like get stuff done early on in the day. So I try and look at like what's required of me at that period of time and then adjust my routines and habits to the, 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 the need, you know? Yeah. yeah. You've, um, you started off on Instagram with uh, the leading conversation and then you kind of build that into a nice podcast. And uh, I think being quite successful with your, your first season, I've really enjoyed some of the stuff you guys have done. Um, what is your, what is the thought behind that? What is your goal with it? Are you trying to make it big with podcasting or is it just a fun habit? Oh, sorry. Uh, I'm not sure South African podcasting is big. Eh? Um, but, but so, I mean, I'm not, I, I wouldn't say we get like, I'm going to invest huge amounts of money and time in, into that. Um, the, what's the goal is that I, I, I find I've got a natural curiosity around getting better and, I think there's a lot of people who do as well. And I, I enjoy having conversations. I think I've got a skill at being able to craft decent conversations with people. Um, and I wanted to put it to use. So, you know, in order for us to get and spend an hour with someone who can teach us something and therefore teach the world, just excites both me and Kyle, you know? Mm. So that's why Kyle and I started the leading conversation. We both just curious and excited. And actually Kyle and I, I've interviewed him a few times and I've interviewed him in lockdown for the Stormers. And I was like, that was pretty good. Why don't, why don't we do a bit more of this? Yeah. Um, and we did. So yeah. that's why we now have, you know, that's why we now have it. So I'd love to get more listeners. I'd love more people to listen. Um, so my goal is to, you know, double, triple, quadruple our listenership and, and see where we go from there. Yeah. Yeah. Are you doing all of that yourself? The, the kind of the editing and all of that, or you got someone helping you? Yeah, Carl. <laughs> no, I, 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 uh, I'm, the, I'm the sort of content guy, and I generally find the guests and think of the content and sort of be the anchor, so to speak. And then Carl, Carl does the editing, uh, the back end stuff. Yeah, yeah. So what's what's Tom's Tom's goal and dreams going forward? What do you want to look back on one day and be be proud of? What is the the end goal for you? It's a great question. You know, actually, my wife and I were talking earlier and like, sort of saying like. I need to, I need to sit down at some point in the very near future and craft what 2021 is going to look like. I, I, I find it hard to go too far ahead. Like I, I don't know what's going to happen. Um, uh, but, but there's a lot going on at the moment and there's sort of some opportunities and I, I think one needs to be quite selective around where, where you put your attention. Otherwise you can just do a lot of stuff averagely rather than little stuff really well. Yeah. Um, I still, I think I still want to win a World Cup. Uh, it's still a dream of mine. Uh, yeah. I'd love to be at a World Cup and and, and, and helping a team win. Um, I uh, I've always had that goal. Like that, I would say is my big dream. Um, and probably in the more short term, you know, I'd love to be part of a winning Super Rugby or whatever comp we're in campaign. Um, I desperately, desperately would love to win a Varsity Cup um, with ECT. Um, you are on I track. Yeah. Like Sorry, yeah, yeah. you were kind of on no, track. You guys were doing well. No, we were doing well. We were doing nicely, but uh, we had a lot to we got we we had a lot to learn. I had a lot to learn. We all had a lot to learn, um, and and we still do. But 
you know, I, 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 that would be, that would be massive for me. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think I'll ultimately just, just be someone that um, people say, geez, you know, we really want to work with this guy because we think he can add value to our team. Um, and, you know, I mean, what can I lie? You know, you would like to be successful financially so that you can do that and take holidays when you want to take holidays and be a little bit more choosy around, around who you work with. So, yeah, I, I'm I'm not I'm not a massive like goal setter. Put these like I, I I've never really been massive in that, but I'm pretty intentional around the work that I want to do, um, and it's taken a lot of introspection, a lot of thinking around saying you know like you really like doing teaming work, you really like speaking in, in, to groups, um, and you really enjoy coaching, yeah. um, and if I can use those three things, like let, let me go and become the best of them, you know. Mm. Yeah, I ask uh, every guest three questions, but I'm going to change them up a little bit for you and put you on the spot a little bit. And uh, what I normally ask is, what is one message you might give to a younger version of yourself if you had to speak to him now? But you're still quite young, so I don't know if there's maybe there's something. But let's go with that one for now, and then we'll we'll adapt it just now. Yeah, uh, cool. Um, I'd say Nick, like, remain as curious as possible. Uh, and, and don't always tell people what you know. Try and listen, um, and don't and don't fall into the trap of am I ready or am I not ready? I don't think I think ready is a myth. You're never ready. Mm. I, I've never been. I don't think anyone's ready for anything. But you you you're ready enough, and you and and go forward. You know. So I spoke to someone today, and I said to them like, ready? Yeah. Don't worry about being ready. Just get busy doing, and then let's learn from that. You know. And I'll help you learn from that. But let's get busy doing. So. Yeah. I suppose that's that would be my answer for that yeah. question. Did you suffer? Did you suffer a little bit with um, what do they call it, imposter syndrome, when you were younger? Is that where that kind of comes from? Um, I I, I don't think so. I don't think so. But you definitely I don't, I don't even know if it's suffering, but you're definitely nervous. Yeah. You know, and you definitely think like, geez, can I be working at this level? Um, I don't know if I felt like full imposter syndrome, or whatever, but maybe, maybe. Um. I just think like, you know, the more people I speak to, the successful people are curious, but they also back themselves, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think you've got to, in, in our industry that we're working in, like, shit, some people don't even back our industry, let alone do they back us. <laughs> so sometimes you've got to just say like, hey, I'm coming, buddy, and I'm going to do my best and I'm going to deliver. When I think back to some of the things I did when I was younger um, with teams and with individuals, I'm like... I'm not sure that was amazingly theoretically correct, but I did it with energy and the right, um, like, will, you know, like I wanted to help. And I think that, like, keeps you in the door. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So then the way I would adapt that now is if, if you could give a young coach coaching a team, maybe like a Western province on the 15 or 17 side, they obviously deal with a lot. There's um, a lot of, a lot of young coaches in that kind of environment. Um, and I feel sorry for them because I don't feel they, they always get the support they need. They're often thrown into the deep end. So one little message of motivation or something you've learned as a young coach that you would share with them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's such a cliche, isn't it? But like, you're going you're to make mistakes and you think that your mistake is the end of the world, but it probably isn't, you know? Um, and that... I've been lucky enough to work with some really, really good coaches, professional coaches, and they still make massive stuff ups all the time. Um, and my, yeah, my message of motivation is you, you are making stuff ups and, and own them, you know, own your, own, own your stuff ups and enjoy, enjoy is hard, but own your stuff ups, learn from your stuff ups um, and realize that you'll become better after that. You know, you'll learn more and more and more. So I don't know, it probably links to the last, the, the previous thing, like yeah. stay flipping care about your own stuff up. Yeah, sweet. This question uh, always always gets interesting answers. Um, but I think from your point of view, it's probably going to be the most accurate one because often sportsmen don't really know, they haven't thought about it. Would you say mental strength and mental toughness is, is natured or nurtured? I don't even know what mental toughness is. Yeah, I thought that's what you're going to say. <laughs> I, I don't know. Think that's what you're gonna say. Yeah, like I, 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 I wouldn't know. You know, like I used to say, oh, it's your ability to control your thoughts in any situation. But 
I don't know. Like, you know, <laughs> my issue with that, Nick, is that, you know, there's this like, I think there's almost like a myth that mental toughness is like controlling, it's like controlling everything, like controlling your emotions. Yeah. And I, I don't think it is. Eh? Like, I think you can be flipping tough if you are and, and, and still experience a wide range of emotions. So I think that I think the means the most mentally tough people are are, are resilient people, and I I would assume you might know more than I I would assume that there are things that had happened in that person's life, uh, experiences that that person might have been through, and the way that they um, have been brought up that would have that would have nurtured that resilience. Yeah. You know, and I think at the highest level of sports, sports is by nature something that makes you fail and fail publicly a lot more than you'll succeed you'll fail yeah so i think that resilience is just the most important thing or grit probably yeah. which is more like long-term resilience in fact that's a book that you should be grit by angela duckworth it's an outstanding book yeah. um and i would say that 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 for me is can can definitely be nurtured hmm. okay yeah so so the way when i say mental toughness i try to frame it in that way for people to kind of understand from the cliche point of view. So resilience and grit is also probably what I am referring to when I'm asking that question. Because the way I see it is what you were referring to about controlling emotion stuff. That's emotional intelligence. And that's different from being resilient. You know, you can have an emotional intelligent person that has very little resilience on a sports field. Um, but they might be very good at controlling their emotions. So resilience, grit, you think that can be nurtured? Yeah, I, I think so. I, I definitely think so. Um, you know, as uh, as I said, like through your experiences, through your childhood, but then if you're dealing with an athlete, like definitely, like if you put yourself in situations more and more and more, um, where you have to push yourself to the limit, you're gonna you're gonna get better at it. You know, so I, I I'm unequivocal. I would say you definitely definitely can get better at something, and you just got to practice pushing through. You know, yeah. um, you develop grit by practicing. I think it's easier to be resilient in things that you are passionate about. Mm. So if you find something meaningful and you find something that you're good at, it's easier to be resilient. So yeah. I would say for me, in my career, I've shown fairly good resilience. You know, you get kicked down, you don't get business, someone else, it's like, it's tough in sports. But am I resilient in another area of my life? Probably not. So I think resilience is not necessarily something you have all the time. You can show resilience or grit in different areas more than you can in others yeah yeah it comes down to to uh sorry for going a bit theoretical but victor frankl's whole thing about you know meaning meaning finding meaning in life so you know purpose driven whatever so i think that's the same if you have enough meaning and enough what is, what is that quote he who has enough why can deal with any how or something like that and it really just comes down to that yeah no i think that's i think that's spot on i think that's spot on what are the five most important things in your life? You want that? <laughs> um, uh, my wife. Um, have, having a good time with friends. Uh, having the opportunity to succeed and shine. Music. Okay. And um, how many is that? Four. Yeah. Uh, something that I want to be my fifth one because I want to get better at it is just connecting with other people. Mm. That's powerful. It's powerful because there's nothing materialistic in any of those things. You know, oftentimes I get answers that are quite shallow so it's, it's refreshing to get something like that what is what does music give you why music oh i absolutely love it it's still, it's like it can take me to different spaces it's an absolute mood change i love i find music particularly powerful so i love music that's power uh the sound the words um i find like i can get lost in music um completely lost in music so yeah there's very little that's as powerful as music and to experience music together like singing together and people singing together is like it's like that's spiritual for me you know it's like yeah. it, 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 it takes you to an almost like the next level of power and emotion that you can feel 
yeah. so yeah that's i think that's what music does for me it like allows for feeling awesome tom i'd love to to dig into more of these uh wow. concepts on a on a deeper level on a more um detailed level um but not over zoom i'd love to to come and chat to you when i'm in cape town do a podcast face to face so we can really dig into some of these things and pick your brain more on things but for now thanks for your time man, and thanks for for what you've shared and and um I hope someone out there takes something from this and uh, I've definitely taken some stuff. So thanks a lot. No, cool, man. Thank you. I think, um, well done for you, for doing, to you for doing this, you know, I think, um, the fact that you're willing to be curious and put yourself out there, you, you, you know, um, often as a coach or mentor coach or whatever it is that you, that you want to be, um, you, you're not going to run Broncos and hundred meters with the players and what have you. But what you are doing is you're putting yourself out into an industry that's not that easy to do itself, you know. And I think kudos to you for being able to put yourself out there because in a way you are, you are showing an example to the people that you're working with. So, yeah, thanks. And thanks very much for having me. I appreciate, I appreciate your time. Cool. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. We'll cool, chat man. soon and we'll, we'll set it up when I'm there. Absolutely, babe. Anytime. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks, Tomo. Go well, brother. Oh, you too. Bye, bye. Cheers.